things short and sweet as we move forward uh, when we uh, when we get together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, that'll be five o'clock this afternoon. Um, and uh, wanted to wanted to mention uh, one of the ministries uh, that uh, uh, that we have uh, that we have going on uh, is Jane is sending cards to people for their uh, for their birthdays and, and anniversaries and things. And I just I wanted to share this from my daughter uh, from Whitney. She got her birthday card. I was supposed to have done this a couple weeks ago because uh, her birthday was, was August the 7th, but uh, she sent uh, this note to the church. Uh, Raven and Az, thank you so much for the birthday card and well wishes. Uh, even though I am attending a different church, Raven and Azarine will always be my home, and all of you will always be my family. And love and God bless Whitney O'Keefe. And uh, she, uh, uh, that, that tickled her. Uh, and she uh, she attends the um, uh, well. She is involved in their children's ministry uh, at the uh, Southland uh, Christian Church, uh, the uh, the Richmond campus. And uh, so she helps uh, she helps in their uh, children's church uh, there. And um, so that's uh, that's where she's attending. But she wanted us to be sure and thank you because uh, this is her home church. And and uh, she appreciated uh, getting that. Uh, am I forgetting anything else? I didn't have a list this morning. Shannon, is there anything I'm forgetting? Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's stand this morning. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jeff. Jeff Horn, would you open us with a word of prayer this morning? May be seated. Let's turn to page 473. 473. I am thine, O Lord. soul look up with a 
to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy and I may not reach till I rest in should be our prayer this morning for him to draw us near to him. And uh, I want you to turn then to 437, 437, trust and obey. <clears throat> Wonder, uh, uh, I, I, I'm certain that I'm not the only one that from time to time has trouble trusting. Sometimes we have a little doubt, don't we? And, uh, but we, the, the, the scripture tells us and, and God tells us that we need to trust him and that we need to obey him. And uh, that's what we're, uh, we're going to sing, Trust and Obey, this, uh, this morning, 437. <laughs>
sing uh, number 600. Um, I need thee every hour this morning as our, uh, uh, as our uh, prayer uh, course. We're going to sing the first verse of that uh, this morning, but uh, before, uh, before that, uh, we want to, uh, <clears throat> certainly want to mention uh, uh, those uh, that, are, that are sick and uh, those that are, that are, uh, that are hurting. Uh, uh, we want to remember Mary Brenniger. Uh, and I think uh, Shauna talked uh, with her Friday, and she's at uh, Clark Regional uh, in Winchester uh, and um, hoping to start uh, rehab of the, the broken hip shortly. Uh, so we want to remember her. Uh, of course, we want to continue to remember Brandon and, and Amy and, uh, and Debbie and all that. <laughs> They have had going on, uh, and Brandon, uh, my understanding is God just keeps working miracles. And Amen. Amen. So we want to continue uh, to remember them. Um, Kiara. Uh, is home waiting. <laughs> That's what we were told. So she's been to the hospital and back. So, uh, yeah, so she's in that window. Uh, so we want to remember her and Jacob as they. Uh, uh, hopefully, here in the next few days, welcome a welcome another baby into the house. Uh, so uh, we want to continue to remember uh, remember her. Um, any uh, uh, there, uh, Neil uh, brought to my attention this morning uh, a young man that just uh, just graduated um, last year from our school, uh, Cole Boy, uh, uh, Jeremy Cole's son, Hunter. Hunter Cole was involved in a very serious accident last night, and uh, so we want to remember uh, remember him uh, at this time. Remember. Yeah, we're all going to mourn him from uh, his suicide and his sister and son who passed away over the weekend. And um, the address that they gave us was a really depressing note, and not what we saw in the note, but a note that I could read that it asked that we would really pray. Certainly want to continue to remember uh, remember Sharon and also Tracy. And, um, let's uh, let's stand this morning. As always, if you have needs this morning, and uh, we can our unspoken request uh, if you have those. Uh, but if you have needs this morning, you just want to come and pray for somebody else, for somebody else's need. Our altars are open, and uh, we encourage you to come if you uh, if you wish and pray. We're going to sing this first verse of I Need Thee Every Hour, and then Pastor Jason will come and pray for us. <laughs> Yeah. 
Dear Lord, we come to you today in need of you, in need of your awesome power, in need of your amazing grace, in need of your compassion, your love and mercy. Lord, there's so many needs in our midst, so many people out sick who need a divine touch from you, who who need comfort during this, this time. Some at home waiting ex- expectantly and excitedly for, for an important things to happen, like new life being born. Some, Lord, who have received your touch and has, have been, are serving as testimonies to your power and your greatness, God. And, and Lord, they still need you. They still need you as they recover. They still need you as they move and take steps forward. God, we know you're faithful. We know that you're good. We know that you are one who always keeps your word. You're always one who is working on our behalf. And so as we lift up these needs to you, as we lift up Brandon, as we lift up Mary, as we lift up these, these, little, these little kids that are in, in the hospital, God, and struggling with things, we know that we are lifting them up to a God who answers prayer, who God is, a God who is working, a God who is not distant, but whose presence is right there in their midst. We love you, Lord. Lord, we need you. We need you in this service. We need you with each and every step we take. We need you when we leave here today and we go to eat lunch. We need you when we we get in our cars and we we drive and go about and and spending our day. We need you as we go about our, our lives during this week. There's not a moment that goes by, God, where we do not need you. But Lord, you know, some of us here today, where we maybe we're a little tired. Maybe we were a little weary. Maybe we were just a, a, a little bit distracted. Oh God, would you return our focus to you? Would you guide our steps? Would your, would your, would your spirit be here in our midst today, speaking to our hearts and minds? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our ushers will uh, will come. Um, we're going to take our uh, regular tithes and offerings, and um, this morning, and then um, and then we're going to, guys. When you when we finish this, I'm going to ask you to come back, and uh, we're going to take a, a different uh, special offering this morning. I'll explain that when we when we get there. But uh, we're going to do uh, regular tithes and offerings this time. Beetle, pray for.
thank you, thank you, Neil, uh, for that offertory. Uh, we're going to take a uh, we're going to take a love offering this morning. Um, you all know uh, Brandon and Amy have been. <laughs> this has been going on now for weeks, and uh, uh, of course he's not working. She's have to miss a lot of work. Uh, dealing, you know, being at the hospital and, and back and forth. Uh, so we're going to take a special offering this morning. Uh, put in what you can uh, as a gift to them to help them out with their expenses during this time, if nothing else with the, the travel and, and everything else that's, uh, that goes on around this, these hospital stays and, and all the things that are going on. And uh, if you want to make out a check, Make it out to the church because we'll put it all in, in uh, Vicki will write one, one check from the church uh, for, uh, uh, for the amount. But uh, we're going we're gonna to take uh, an offering for them. So, guys, if you would, um, let me, uh, Father God, we, do, we thank you for this, this opportunity um, that we have to be here together this morning to worship you and uh, to, to sing your praises and to pray together and to worship together and to hear your word. Uh, and Father, and we do we pray for your, uh, for your anointing on Jason as he uh, speaks to us this morning. Father, right now we're going to pause for just a second to do what I believe and we believe that you have taught us to do and that you have told us to do. And that is to support our brothers and sisters when they're in need. And Father, I just pray right now that, that, that right now that Brandon and Amy could feel your presence in a special way around them. Uh, we know you're with them. We've heard the, the, the miracles that are already happening uh, and have been happening, and we thank you and praise you for that. Uh, but we just pray that even at, at this very moment that they could just feel your presence in a special way. Let them know that you love them and that we love them. And uh, just, Father, as we give back, as we try to give here to help them during this time, I pray that you will bless the gift, bless the giver, uh, use the money however they need to use it to make this journey that they're on uh, to, to be helpful in this journey and that maybe it will help ease some of, the, some of the things that are going on. But just help us, Father, to give, to give generously, and to continue to support our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you and praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. And uh, at this time, men, bring a hymnal, turn to page 256, and come this morning is Men's Group Sunday. So we're going to sing Because He Lives uh, this morning uh, before Brother Jason brings his message. So all, any, any and all of you that would like to help us, come and sing uh, Because He Lives, page 256.
you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. Now, I served uh, with the Indiana Army National Guard. Oh, my mic's not working. I'll lay you in. <laughs> They're just stretching for what's about to happen. So, <laughs> Exodus chapter 17. Uh, yeah, for those that, some of you may know, sorry, but I served briefly with the Indiana Army National Guard as a combat medic. And during my time in training, there's, there's one thing that the Army really loves to do, and, and I'm pretty sure all the branches of the Armed Forces do this, except for maybe the Air Force, uh, because I've never seen them do this, but most of us, we did exercises, right? We had to do things. And uh, I had some favorites, you know? Th these are things you had to do when, when, say, your supply sergeant walks past you and says, uh... Hey, here's a razor, and you look at them and you say, hey, is that for my legs? When you say it like that, you, not only do you get to do the exercise to get bigger and stronger, you get to do the exercise because you're in trouble. Yeah, that's how they discipline you. So you, you, as you can imagine, I developed some favorites during my time, like what's called the mountain climbers, where you get down like you're going to do a push-up, and you just kick your legs back and forth. I just loved that one. It was so much fun. Uh, then there, there was another one that, this one was really creative, it's called the Little Man in the Woods. Does anybody want to know what the Little Man in the Woods exercise is? You pretty much, you get down in a squat, and then you do a jumping jack from the squatted position. It, it was a great time. I mean, I'm telling you, you've not lived life until you've experienced the Little Man in the Woods. But my all-time favorite, and this, one, this one's kind of crazy because it doesn't sound like it's that complicated. But it was called the overhead arm clap. And I want you all to experience that like I did. Back in the so when I want the congregation to do this, I want you all to stand up. I want you all to... And, and I want to preface this by saying, in my three weeks here, you know, I've, had, I've visited the hospital several times. Someone has fallen and broken their arms, so I thought to myself, I think you all need some good exercise to build up your strength. So I don't have to do these things anymore, okay? <laughs> so we're going to do the overhead arm clap together. So I want you to spread out, all right? And the way this works is you're going to hold your arms like this, and you just raise, and you clap it together above your head. You bring it down and back up. So what we're going to do is I'm going to set a timer for two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Oh, I got Nicole's phone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, like, just do that. Just do that for a few seconds here. And see, it's not that complicated, is it? It doesn't feel like it's that bad. But now imagine you're at round 150. <laughs> and your arm feels like it weighs 1,000 pounds. You know, uh, they, good job, everybody. Good job. You're all getting stressed out. You're ready for church today. How, see, you didn't know you were going to get exercise at church today. <laughs> see, your pastor doesn't just take care of your spiritual health. He takes care of your physical health, too. But your arms get tired, right? They get tired when you have to hold things up for long periods of time. And in our passage today, that's what happens to Moses. Moses' arms get tired. So we're going to read this passage in Exodus chapter 13 together, starting at verse 8. There we go. At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, Select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed against, against them. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with a sword. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, you guys did better this week. All right, good job. 
Pat yourselves on. You did exercise and you, you, yeah, you recited things. Good job. Well, at the beginning of Exodus 17, if you read those first several verses, uh, you'll, you'll read that God does an, a miracle for the nation of Israel. Remember, they have just left Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. They've crossed the Red Sea. Uh, they, they complained because they were hungry in chapter 16, and, and God gave them manna. And then, on their way to Rephidim, while they're there, they discover that there's no water. And they just start complaining. Because that's what people do, right? They complain. I mean, not you all. You all don't complain, right? You, no, you guys don't do that. I don't complain either. And if Nicole says otherwise, just don't believe her. <laughs> she just threatened me. Just, I, I want it recorded on, on camera that Nicole just threatened me. <laughs> but, they're complain- but they're complaining to the point where Moses is fearful for his life. Because go- Moses goes to God while they're complaining, and he says, Hey, they're going to stone me. God, you've got to do something. So God tells Moses, hey, you remember that stick I gave you? Why don't you take that stick and go smack that rock over there with it? That might not be the exact translation, but it's close. And when Moses smacks that stick against the rock, water comes out of the rock, and there's enough there and then some for the entire nation to get a drink. That's a miracle. That's a miracle through the power of God. But the Bible has this interesting pattern if you study it. Whenever God does something miraculous for his people, it's just so strange. God does this amazing thing, this incredible thing, that the world wouldn't believe if you told them. If if they were there to witness it, they still wouldn't believe it. But God does it, and it happens. But immediately following those events, what seems to always happen is some enemy comes along and tries to undermine the goodness of God. Every single time. And that's exactly what happens here. Because no sooner does the water stop draining from the rock, that news comes to Moses that, hey, the Malachites have attacked our people. We are under attack in this moment. God just did something good, but now this bad thing has happened. So who, these, the, the group that attacks the Israelites, these are the Amalekites. Uh, these, the Amalekites are a fierce, nomadic group that, that wander through the wilderness. Kind of similar to the way, the way that Israel's going to do for the next 40 years. But that's who they are. And they are an opportunistic group because when you're wandering through the wilderness from area to area, if you come up on a group that's weaker than you, they have things that you need. And you can get it from them, and they're not big enough to stop you. So that's who the Malachites are. They're descendants of Esau. Now, if we were, if we, there's there's another account of this event in the book of Deuteronomy. If you go look in Deuteronomy chapter 25, uh, it talks about this same story in Deuteronomy 25. And and for those that maybe don't know, the book of Deuteronomy is essentially Moses' goodbye address to the people before he goes up on the mountain and he, and he dies. And so he, during his goodbye address, he's recounting this event. He's reminding them of what God has brought them to, through. And he adds this detail to the story that you don't find in Exodus. He says, remember the Amalekites. Remember what they did to you on the journey from after you left Egypt. They met you along the way and attacked all your stragglers from behind when you were tired and weary. Remember, the people, they, they, were, they just got water. They just got their energy back from, from this water coming from a rock. You know, if you, you, know, you, you know what it's like when you're thirsty. And even after you get your fluids back, it takes a minute to get your energy back to match what you just put in. You know, if you come by after I get done running on, on, on a weekday morning, you'll see me sitting on the front porch over here, trying to get back, back to where I can get back and be normal again. That's never worked, though. I've never really been normal. <laughs> but notice there's two things that this says. It says, first, the Amalekites met them along the way. 
So this tells us that as the Israelites are traveling from Egypt to Mount Sinai, they're just simply going where God's told them to go. They're just trying their best to survive from point A to point B, and that's when the Amalekites show up. They show up. They're not provoked. That Israel's not picking a fight with them. They're just simply going about their business, and the Amalekites come and attack them. They're just being bullies. They see opportunity, and they're going to pounce. And if that wasn't bad enough, I think this is the part that really gets God upset. And it says, they attacked all your stragglers from behind. So this, this, this group of nomads that, that sees the opportunity, they don't just attack Israel. They don't just go after them for no other reason other than, 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 than greed. They attacked the weakest part, the stragglers that were behind them. You know who the stragglers were? The women, the children, and the elderly. The people that couldn't defend themselves. That's who they attacked. And, and if you continue on into verse 19 and 20 of this uh, the passage in Deuteronomy, God's going to tell, them, tell the, the Israelites, hey, you remember this. You don't forget it. You write it down because there's going to come a day where you're going to set this right and you're going to wipe them from the face of the earth. Matter of fact, that's why God gets mad at King Saul later on, right? Because Saul is fighting the Amalekites and God tells them to wipe them all out. And, and rather than wipe them all out, he takes their the best of their livestock, and he takes their king and holds him captive as a prisoner. And God gets mad at him because he doesn't do what God tells him to do. That's, that's these same Amalekites. Th this, is, this is the reason why. Right here, because of what they do to God's people in this moment. They attack God's people when they were vulnerable, and they take out the weakest part of the population. Now, in verse 9, it tells us that Moses goes to Joshua and sa tells him, Hey, I want you to go round up the boys, and you're going to go fight. You're going into battle. You're going to war. So go find some. This is the first time in the Bible that Joshua is mentioned. And Joshua is a really important figure in the nation of Israel, in the history of Israel. Right? Who is Joshua? Does anybody know who Joshua is? What's he going to do? He's going to fight the battle of Jericho. What else? He's going to lead them into battle when they get to the promised land. Exactly right. He is going to be their commander of the army. He is God's man. He's going to succeed Moses. And notice, though, like, Moses is leading them to the promised land, but when they get to the promised land, they need a different type of leader. They need a military commander. And Joshua's the guy. And this is the moment where God is calling Joshua through Moses. Moses goes to Joshua and says, Hey, you're going to be the commander of the army. Congratulations. Now go find some people and go fight. This is a tall task. Stop and think about who he's, he's, who he's searching for soldiers from. This is a group of people that were slaves and were just freed. I don't know that they really had any military training. Because let's, let's face it, if you were the Egyptians, would you train your slaves on how to fight in battle? Maybe if you were a general that didn't want to get hurt yourselves because officers have a tendency to do those things. Any officer, former officers in here? Good. <laughs> But outside of that, you're not going to train your slaves to fight for you because what's going to happen? They're going to come and fight you. So these aren't trained soldiers. They don't, have, they don't even have the weapons for war. Been, they're wandering through the desert. And this is who Joshua was told, hey, go find, some, go find some soldiers from this lot. Good luck. <laughs> you're going to get them together and you're going to go fight these folks. But verse 10 tells us that Joshua answers his call and he goes out to face this challenge. Doesn't argue, doesn't say, hey Moses, you picked the wrong person. 
doesn't plead with God to give it to somebody else, doesn't plead with God to give him someone else. He just says, all right, here we go. Now, while the plan, that, so that, that, the battle plan is Joshua gets army, and they're going to go fight the Amalekites. He's got to find them, he's got to get them together, and then, then they're going to go as a team, and they're going to fight as a team. But see, Moses, while he put the, this battle plan together, notice he doesn't leave himself out, does he? Moses doesn't say, you go do the fighting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, go over here to McDonald's to have a cup of coffee and get my you know, sausage, egg, and cheese McMuffin, and, and you guys just bring me the results when it's over. He doesn't do that. Moses says, while you're down there fighting, I'm going to go up here on the hilltop, and I'm going to take that, that, that staff that God's given me. I'm going to take it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it up. Remember that staff. That staff that Moses has in his hand. It's not a magic trinket. It's not like some magic wand of a wizard. But that staff has a story behind it, doesn't it? That staff is a symbol of God's power. Think about what, what, what that staff had been a part of in the story thus far. We just, read, we just talked about it at the beginning of this chapter. He takes it and he smacks it against a rock and water comes out. When they are at the Red Sea and the, the Egyptian army is, is coming behind them, what, what is it that is used and stretched out over the Red Sea. It's that staff. What was it that was used to strike the Nile and turn it to blood? What was dropped on the ground and became a serpent that ate all the other serpents? I love that story, part of the story because when Pharaoh's magicians drop the staff and it becomes a snake, he's like, oh look, we did the same thing, but he ignores the part where God's staff eats the other ones. Oh, but he did the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Same thing when the, well, I'm off topic now, but, but when, when, the, when he uses the staff and he turns the Nile into blood, right, through the power of God, remember what happens, the Egyptian magicians come along and they do the same thing, and like, but they don't do the whole river that's moving, they do this little pot of water. Hey God, look, we did the same thing. No, he didn't. <laughs> but that's what, that staff that Moses has in his hand, when he goes on that hilltop, it's not an ordinary staff. It's a symbol of God's power and God's presence with his people. So we get down to verse 11. I'm going the wrong way. So the battle starts. And it tells us Moses holds up his hands. And most likely when he's holding up his hands, he's holding up that staff. So he's not empty-handed, he's holding that staff up. As long as he's holding that staff up, he is showing the people that symbol of God's power. This army that's being led by Joshua, who's his first time battle commander, being followed by people who weren't trained to be soldiers, not equipped with soldiering equipment, he is holding that staff up as a symbol of God's power, reminding the people, this is the power you need in this moment. You need God's power. So Moses is holding this staff up over his head, and he's holding it up as an action of prayer. He is reminding the people whose help they need, and he's crying out to God by lifting those hands up, saying, God, our nation needs you right now. If we're going to win this battle, if we're going to get to where you're telling us to go, if we're going to become the people you tell us to be, we need your help to get there. So he holds that staff up. And the clearest thing happens as you read verse 12, right? And in, in this passage, verse 11 and 12 and 13. I guess it's 11. Well, when Moses holds his hands up, while that staff is raised in the air, the Israelites are winning. They are winning this battle. This, uh, this group of untrained soldiers being led by a first-time commander is somehow winning the battle. But when Moses' hands start to get tired, because arms get tired, right? When we did the overhead arm clap for just a couple seconds, right? And some of you were like, Pastor, I'm not coming back next week because I don't want to do any more exercise. <laughs> but his, he's holding that thing up. This isn't a couple minutes. This is a battle. I mean, it's a battle. It's taking a while. 
And that thing starts to get heavy. And he's trying with everything he has to hold it up, but he can't. His arms are getting tired. It's starting to slip. And every time he starts to slip, his arms start to go down. The battle begins to swing the other way. Verse 12 tells us, not there. Verse 12 tells us, Moses' hands grow heavy. Stop and think about this. Joshua and his men, they're down there. They're, they're the ones actually physically fighting the battle. They're the ones exerting energy, fighting against the enemy. But it, this passage makes no mention that they're getting tired. And I think it's because when you're, when, when you're in the fight for your life and trying to survive, you have this thing called adrenaline that kicks in. That will to live kicks in, and it pushes you, gives you that little bit of an extra mm. And that's what's happening. They, they don't have time to feel the weariness now. Now, when that battle's over, they're going to feel it. They're going to need a nap. Maybe a Snickers bar. But they're tired. But, but, but they don't feel it. So they just keep on fighting, because if they stop, they die. It's an, it's an interesting factor, Right? When, you, when, when you're faced with that scenario, you, to keep going or die, you're going to keep going. You're going to keep clawing. You're going to do whatever it takes, and that's what they're doing. They don't get tired, but Moses does. And all Moses is doing is holding up a staff and praying. Aaron and her noticed that Moses, every time Moses' hands begin to droop, as he's trying to hold it up, he, every time it begins to droop, the battle begins to swing the other way. So what do they do? They're, they're trying to help Moses out. They go find him a rock and say, hey, Moses, sit on this rock. Maybe that'll help. Maybe, maybe you can use the strength that we are using from standing. You can sit down and keep your arms up, you know, that way. And that, that only lasts for so long because your arms get tired. And so when Moses can't hold his arms up by himself anymore, Aaron and her, one grabs one side, one grabs the other, and they are hoisting his arms up, holding them in the air for him. And keep in mind, it's not that Moses has quit. It's not that Moses has given up lifting up this need in prayer. It's just his arms are that heavy. He is that tired. He is trying to get up, but he just can't do it. But Aaron and her step in, and they hold, hold it up for him. And it says that he holds it up. Until the sun goes down, and verse 13 tells us that Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. Now, this is kind of a cool thing. In verse 13, that word defeated, if you look it up in the original language, there's, there's some different ways you can translate it. That, that If you look at it from that perspective, this tells you how sound the defeat of the Amalekites was. It can be also be translated to being embarrassed. The Amalekites were embarrassed by this untrained, unprofessional army who, got, who beat them through the power of God's intervention. They were embarrassed. It said they were mowed down. Pretty much like any team that's faced the Reds this year. There it is. There it is, uh, Christian, for you. <laughs> mowed them down. They had no chance. They were outmatched and outclassed. Not because of Israel, not because of Joshua's brilliant t tactics, but because God intervened for his people and fought with them and for them. Right. All right, Jason, you told us all this. You've been talking for a really long time. I'm getting hungry. What does this have to do with you and me? Well, for starters, someone had to go face the Amalekites. Someone actually had to suit up, find the weapons, and go fight the battle. Some of you, that's where you're at today. Today for you is not a day of prayer. Today for you is not a moment of, of trying to figure out what God's plan is. You've already been praying. You've always, already been seeking God's wisdom. And you know today that when you leave here, that whatever it is you're facing, today is the day that you have to fight. There, always, there will come a time where you have to do the fighting. You can pray, and it's good to pray. We should always be praying. But there's, there comes a moment where our prayer has to turn into action. Uh, I served on staff at a church in Colorado for a little while, and there was an older gentleman there. Uh, his name was Pastor Mike. 
And we, we, had, we had staff meetings every Wednesday. And I, I'll never forget this. We, I've been there for about five or six months, and we, we gather there. It's me, the lead pastor, Pastor Mike, and, and uh, this, this other pastor that was on staff and the staff secretary. We're all sitting there together, and we're doing our usual talk and planning things. And Pastor Mike goes, we do an awful lot of planning at these things, but very little action. Whew. <laughs> See, there's time for planning, but there's a time where you actually do something. So some of you, that might be where you're at. Maybe there's a habit in your life that you're trying to overcome. Well, and, and you know that when you leave here today, the time to begin to act and get rid of that habit is now. Maybe you're fighting for your marriage. And you know that, that all the praying is waiting. Now is the time to step in and do something. That's not a time for prayer. That's a time for action. That might be where some of you are at. If that's you today and you're facing and you're in a moment of time to fight, remember that song we sang today? Trust and obey. That's what you gotta do. You gotta trust him. You gotta trust that God's been preparing you for this moment. He's led you to this point in time for a reason, that he's going to give you the strength to overcome. Trust him. I would say trust the steps he's laid before you, but if maybe you're like Abraham and God's not giving you an itinerary yet. I got news, he's probably not going to give you one. Trust him and move forward with what you know. Now, then there's the rest of us here this morning. God is, God is calling maybe the person sitting next to you into the battle and, and, and saying, it's time for you to go fight. But God's not saying that to you because it's not your battle to fight. You, you know that, right? There, there's some battles that we can't fight for other people. They have to do it for themselves. But we're still here. And God definitely calls us to love them, right? We still have to love them. God calls us to support them. So maybe some of us, the rest of us here this morning, maybe we're more like Moses. And, our, and God, God's calling us to do is not go down and fight in the battle with them or for them. Maybe God's saying, I want you to go up on the hilltop. You've experienced my power in your life because you, you, you met my son Jesus and, and you experienced that transformative power of his grace come into your life. Your life is a testimony to my power. But I want, so I want you to go on that hilltop as a reminder of what I can do. So as they're facing the battle, they can look to you and remember who I am and what I can do through you. But not only that, not only can you serve as God's reminder of his power, but you can be praying. You can be lifting up that person going into the battle. You can be lifting them to... That, that, that need before God and crying out to God on their behalf saying, God, would you help them? God, they need you. God, they need, you know this is bad. They need to overcome it. You know the, the wreck of a situation, but they need you. And I know you can do it. And when you go on that hilltop to pray from, it's not good enough to just say, oh, I'll pray. This, you can't just send the Facebook praying hands emoji. It's got to be more than that. It's going to be the type where you, it's like you're walking into the temple of God and you're grabbing the horns of the altar and you're shaking it, crying out to God for help, crying out to God to intervene with everything that you have, with every ounce of energy. You've got to be like Moses, lifting your arms up and holding them up until the victory is won. But see, there's a problem when we do that. Arms get tired. Arms get tired. We get distracted easy. See, we think, you know, you know, the spiritual side of things maybe isn't as important as the physical side. It isn't as daunting or as challenging. But when you stop and think about it, when, when you have sat down and you tried to spend time in prayer with God, how many times do you find yourself getting distracted and pulled away from it? How hard is it to keep your focus on God and lifting the needs up to Him? How hard is it to sit there and allow God to speak to you? It's difficult. 
It's a struggle. Because arms get tired. Matthew Henry says this. He says, the more spiritual any service is, the more apt we are to fail and flag in it. Focusing on spiritual matters, especially prayer, is a struggle. But it is a struggle that can be eased when we are surrounded by others who see how desperately God's power is needed in the moment. When we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that understand what our God can do and who He is. When you pray with them, when we pray together, oh man, that changes things. Remember what the Bible tells us when two or three are gathered together in my name? What's it say? Anybody? I'll be there with you. When two or th- just when two or three. What would happen if all of us surrounded around the people that are facing these battles and we lifted up together them as they are going to face it? What would God do then? What would God show us? Prayer is not something that was ever meant to be done alone. God meant for us to share, one another, to share burdens and to lift one another up. And as someone's struggling, and maybe someone here is praying for someone today and, and they're doing their best to lift it up to God and, and that request God's power, but maybe they've been praying for so long, maybe now their arms are starting to get tired. But the beauty of God's church, the beauty of being, of being a part of this family of believers is that, that we can come alongside them and grab their arms and help them lift. Their arms may be tired. They may not have any more strength left, but guess what? I still got some. And maybe, maybe I'll, I'll be there holding it for days and I get too tired. Then Arthur can step in. Shauna can step in. We can rotate and we can be there working together, lifting up these burdens in prayer. Because in the end, it doesn't matter how strong I am. It doesn't matter how self-determined I am. It doesn't matter my skill set. What really matters, when it all boils down to, is that we need God's power. We need Him to be over- overcome anything. We need Him when we go to Walmart. We need Him when we're ordering our lunch. There's not a second where we don't need Him. And the sooner we realize that and we accept that fact that we were created to be dependent upon God, the easier it becomes to pray and seek Him out. And the sooner we realize that God didn't call us to do it alone, but to do it together, the sooner we'll, 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 we'll take up arms and lift, help people lift their needs before God. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 6, he says, Carry one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love God and love others. We love God by loving others. And we love others by praying for them. We pray for them as they face life's battles. We love others by holding up the arms of those praying for others, praying for others facing life's battles. That's how we love other people. It starts there. You may say, well, you know, prayer's not actually doing anything. We've seen, we've seen that a lot, in the, a lot in the news, right? We've had too much prayer. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think we've had enough. You know how I know that? Because every church I've gone to and tried to start a prayer meeting, I can't get people to show up to it. I know that's harsh. I know that's mean. I'm just telling you the truth. That's, that's a fact. I've been, I mean, you're, this is the third church I've pastored. No, and I, yeah, I, I'd start a prayer meeting and I'd be, it'd be me and maybe two other people. I think the church isn't praying enough. I think we're trying to do too many things in our own strength and our own might. And we forgot where the source of our strength and the source of our power comes from. Right? We, we pray about having old-time revivals and seeing God move in our nation, but it's not going to start until God's people humble themselves and pray. Not the world, but you and I. 
We have to be the ones to start praying. You know, here, here next week, I, I did find a prayer box. Okay, I found, I found the key to the prayer box. That was the second challenge. And I talked about next Sunday up here, when you get here, there's, that prayer box is going to be up here, and there's going to be note cards everywhere. And the purpose of that prayer box is we're going to write the names of people who need to experience Jesus in their life. And we're going to put in that box and we're going to pray over it. Because why we're going to believe that God wants to start a revival with us. And he's going to do it by transforming the lives and the names of the people in that box. Amen. They may come to this church and get saved at these altars and we're going to rejoice. But they might not. They may go to the Baptist church. And if they go there and they get saved, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rejoice. Amen. They may go to the Methodist church. One of them. And they get saved there. And what are we going to do? We're going to rejoice. It doesn't matter where they go. They can be out on the fishing boat, get saved while they're fishing. We're going to rejoice. Because why? Because things happen when God's people begin to pray. Prayer is what? Seeking God is how we figure out His direction. It's where we find our strength. When someone's going through a rough time, and they've done all the prayers, but they know somebody else is praying for them. This isn't in my notes, so I'm going on a bunny trail. Go ahead, Nicole, do your symbol. <laughs> Some of you may know that I was divorced, or I'm divorced, okay? I, I got married to a girl, I was 20, she was 18. I went off to do the military thing, and you can probably figure out how the story goes, right? Well, I'll be going into detail. And I was at a very dark spot in my life. I was called to be a pastor. Here I'm getting divorced. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I'll be honest, I don't know that I even wanted to keep going. Because I would go to church and there she would be sitting there with her, her new guy and I was the usher and I had to walk past him and give him the offering plate without hitting him with it. But what kept me going was knowing that God's people were praying for me. That I wanted, when I wanted to quit on myself, God's people wouldn't quit on me. It wasn't through face-to-face -face conversations. And yeah, I had a couple of those. But most of it was through people who were praying and lifting me up before God. John Wesley says this, or said this, I guess he's, he's dead now. The church's cause is ordinarily more or less successful according as the church's friends are more or less fervent in prayer. What, essentially what he's saying is if, if the church wants to succeed, if the church wants to move and be who it's supposed to be, it's going to start when the church prays. And if we're, we're going to live up to that, that law of Christ that calls us to love God and to love others, how can we hope to do that if we're not willing to pray with other people. We can't. And how can we ever hope to, hope to love other people if we're not willing to come along the side of our other believers in Christ and help them lift as they're lifting up needs? Church, we have to be a church that prays. I don't know. This morning, I just I think there's somebody here that today that's facing a battle of some sort. I don't know what it is. I, I just met you all, so if you're like, Pastor, quit, quit preaching at me today. It's not me. Matter of fact, the only person I ever preach at is myself. So I don't know if there's a, maybe you're facing a need today, and you you know you, maybe you're getting ready to go in the battle. And this is kind of that last gasp of air before you face it tomorrow. Or face it this afternoon. Maybe, maybe you need to come and pray. I invite you to come up to these altars. Stand up here. So that way the church of Christ can, can gather around you and pray for you today. So if you're here today and you have a need, come on, come forward. Don't be shy. Maybe you're too afraid to come forward. Just stand where you're at. Because the church will come to you. You realize that? The church doesn't have to, they don't have to come to church for us to pray for them. We can go to where they're at. Matter of fact, I believe my Jesus is big enough that I don't even necessarily have to be physically present, but I can pray for them here, and God can meet them there.
Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you've been lifting a need. Maybe you've been praying for somebody. You've been praying for them earnestly and you, you've been lifting them up before God. But maybe, maybe you've been doing it for so long now that maybe your arms are getting tired. Maybe you've been doing it for so long and you've been praying the same prayer for so many days. But now you're like, God, I feel like it's just becoming words. It's not only your arms getting heavy, but your spirit's getting tired. Come up. Come up here to these altars. Because this is what's going to happen. When you come to these altars, the, the body of Christ is going to rally around you and help you lift your arms back up again. So whatever group you're in this morning, I invite you to come up. No music, no fanfare, just trust and obey. Recognize your need for Him. Amen.